Yes, so welcome. And thank you all for joining us today for a discussion on the state of the field of impact investing. I'm Fran Siegel, and I serve as executive director of the US Impact Investing Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission to build the field and practice of impact investing. And I'm wondering, Kathy, if you could introduce yourself next and then Monique. Sure. My name is Kathy Clark. I am faculty director for CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, which is a research and education center based at Duke University. Uh, we focus on preparing leaders and organizations uh, with business skills uh, required to ch achieve long lasting social and environmental change. Monique? I'm Monique Aiken. I'm VP of Programs at Mission Investors Exchange, a network organization for foundations and others in the impact investing ecosystem seeking to deepen their practice of impact investing. And I am also a contributing editor at Impact Alpha. Thanks, Monique. I now, I, I hear your voice on the brief all the time. <laughs> so, uh, so don't yeah, hate me when you get you. tired of it. No, not at all. <laughs> brief to hear Monique uh, talk about the state of the field <laughs> uh, once a week, Monique, I think. Um, Every other week. <laughs> so next we'd like to get a feel for who you all are in the audience. So um, could you switch to the chat box and share a little bit about who you are, but and specifically the types of topics you'd be interested in hearing about. So rather than doing audience questions at the end, we um, like to understand uh, what you'd like us to, to address and where your head's at, what you're thinking about now so that we can incorporate your ideas in. So if you could do that now, and I know that um, Kathy and Monique will be taking a look at the um, at your comments. And in the meantime, I'm just going to offer a few framing remarks. So Kathy and I have been doing the state of the field session for Kathy, I think it's eight years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but today's session will be a little bit different than it has been in the past. So this year, of course, has been unprecedented, been challenging, difficult for all of us around the world. But it's also given us uh, an opportunity to rethink what we're committed to, how we're addressing essential challenges, and even the language we use to talk about our work. Mm -hmm. So in that spirit, Kathy, Monique, and I re-examined this session and decided it was important to center the discussion within some of the larger societal conversations that are in the public discourse at this time, including those around the health crisis, the already uneven economic recovery, rising acknowledgement and protests around systemic racism, climate change, and the future of capitalism. In previous years, Kathy and I have used this session to examine growth drivers of the field of the impact investing market and to talk about emerging trends, products, funds, and needs from the supply, demand, and intermediation perspectives. We will still touch on these important elements. Uh, for example, I, I know that most of you probably follow the, the Global Impact Investing Network, the GIN, which does an annual report on the size of the field. Um, the most recent report came out this summer and they sized the impact investing market at 715 billion up from 500 billion worth noting that there is some esg investing public markets investing in there but it's, it's it tends to be more of the deep impact investing um but given the confluence of crises that we're facing today we really want to go beyond market sizing and market trends to consider how impact investing factors into broader systems change mm -hmm. As we emerge from this pandemic, uh, we believe that impact investing has a critical role to play in reimagining systems and promoting better accountability. So I'll pass it um, to Kathy and Mon Monique, and maybe you can share what you learned about uh, uh, our audience from the chat, and then we can turn to the discussion. Sure, I'm going to just I pick out a few questions uh, that people have asked and, and Monique, maybe you can still scan as they're coming in because it's hard for me to do both. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the questions I loved was how do we secure authenticity for the mm. field, uh, which is something we definitely want to talk about. Thank you, Phil, for that one. Another one was from Brian at Tideline. Hi, Brian. Was how do you compare, like, you know, we do this kind of annual, what are the trends this year? 
Um, and he's asking us to also look back, like compared to five years ago, or Fran, when you and I started doing this eight years ago, right? What are the big trends? And that's a, a really interesting one, and I'd love to talk about that. I actually had that experience recently. I was in a conference call with someone I haven't worked with in 10 years, I haven't actually seen, and she said, what's changed? And I was <laughs> kind of radical uh, how much it has. And then another one I would mention was, you know, what does it take to radically boost this field right uh, uh, from this point on? Um, and I think that's a good one. Monique, are there any that you would pull out? Yeah, I think there's an important part from Lindsay. Um, well, hello, Lindsay. Uh, what's not moving fast enough? So I think that certainly there's been some interesting responses and we can sort of bifurcate the world, um, as Darren Walker says, in post-COVID, uh, pre-COVID and um, now. And there are certainly some things that have heated up in the last, let's call it six to eight months. Um, but I think the scale and the changes that we require are just enormous and perhaps there are a number of things that have been incubated by the field that just need um, you know, that acceleration in order to really deliver on these really, um, this unique moment, unprecedented as people always say, not to be cliche, but it, it truly is. Um, and I think we can touch on that a little bit as we go. Uh, and I saw that Tim Freinlich uh, uh, fact checked me and said that it's actually eight years. <laughs> <laughs> so we're dating ourselves. Um, let's see, Ruth Shaber said, what is the current evidence to prove that impact investing doesn't have to be concessionary? These are all great, great questions. How much time do you guys have? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that we will keep them coming and um, we will uh, try do, to, to do our best to address these great questions in the context of, of our discussion. So. Um, with, with that uh, framing in mind um, and the input from folks who have joined us today, I'd love to pose the first topic to um, Kathy and Monique, um, or Monique and Kathy, whatever, whatever order you'd like to go in. So, so from your perspectives, what are impact investors doing differently in response to the crisis set that um, I talked about a moment ago? Um, and what have you observed over the past year? So I'll get started and certainly Kathy can chime in. Um, some of the things that I've been observing just in my time at Impact Alpha, they cover, you know, deals from the you know direct investing side of things. And we've seen, I think, a trend towards the back to basics in some ways. Um, Maslow's hierarchy, basic needs, but with a twist pumped up by innovation, either in the tech enabled way that delivering the service or goods. Um, we're in a alternative everything world these days, all protein, all farming mechanisms, all energy, both access and delivery, because we need to be more creative and to connect people to um, in our tech enabled world. And certainly there's a barrier in many places to even just connectivity and energy access. And folks who are coming up with interesting solutions to those things are the ones who seem to be getting funded on the direct investing side of things. I'll just throw throughout this conversation some links in the chat to some of the articles that we're talking about and where the places that we've like garnered our information from just to make it more interesting for folks. We can, people can um, follow the stories themselves and, and see what they want to see in terms of um, what is it telling them also about where the world is. So on the ESG side of things, certainly we've seen an influx of capital um, on the public markets and unprecedented flows of capital. And one of the reasons that is often cited by some of those analysts who are covering such topics is that people are now proximate in, way, in ways to the environmental challenges, and that is changing behavior. Um, not only the wildfires burning all over the globe, um, other kinds of ways that climate change is showing up in people's lives directly, severe storms and the, and the fallout from those things, as well as our own mortality everyone is close to death as a result of COVID in ways that people largely weren't before and privilege protected them from. So COVID is unearthing some um, visceral reactions and also of course the failures and fissures in our systems um, that many have been working on, but is now more apparent to all in ways that it never has before. And finally, the global affordable housing crisis has come to the fore. Um, you know, we, we see a looming challenge here in the United States as a result of economic um, headwinds that have been multiplied by the pandemic and certainly around the rest of the world that has always been, uh, you know, a concern. And 
there are some folks still doing stuff about it. As we can see, these, these social entrepreneurs are getting funded to do some interesting things. And there's one pair of black CEOs, um, Victor McFarland from McFarland Partners and Daryl Carter from Avenant Capital, who have joined forces to issue a $100 million publicly traded REIT to do something about it. So we're seeing some green shoots, despite all of these challenges that we see. Um, and then, of course, racial equity. And someone mentioned in the chat, like, how is that changing the way that we're doing business? And, um, you know, we can certainly see there's some responsiveness to systemic pressures in ways that are unique, as well as understanding um, who needs to retool and what in this post-COVID world and how can they do so. So RBC and MIE have been curating some stories around retooling in an effort to understand what does it take in order to deliver on faster pivots because the systems change that we know will continue to come will require that of um, business leaders. And so some of the stories we're trying to understand what has worked and what hasn't so that we can hopefully inoculate others and build resilience into that community. So I'll pause there and see what Kathy has to share. <laughs> Thanks, Monique. It's a really great start. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, often when Fran and I have framed this in the past, we've talked about kind of supply side and demand side, and we both work on both, but she often pushes me to talk about a little bit about what is going on on the enterprise side. Um, and I did want to say, you know, this has been uh, kind of a earth shaking year for enterprises, um, social enterprises, nonprofit, for profit, you know, big, small, all the way up to corporates. But the the social entrepreneur community, you know, which is widely recognized, especially the nonprofit social entrepreneurs, which many of us work with very closely, you know, they're really the first responders. They're 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 on the ground working with communities of need. Um, and when COVID hit, um, they they were more fragile and 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 were able to you know all of the accountability mechanisms that we think of as part of impact investing um, actually reside in what entrepreneurs can do to understand their stakeholders, right? And so they went on overdrive uh, in terms of trying to figure out what to do quickly with their stakeholders and then trying to figure out how to act about that and then get the message up the chain. Um, and so I just think this has been a really interesting microcosm. I, th I feel like COVID in so many ways has like ripped the blankets off of many things. And this is another thing that it's, you know, kind of ripped the veil off of. Um, we did two things this year that were significant. One, um, I, I got a little bee in my bonnet about enterprises failing, both social and not. And um, created a website back in March. Um, it was actually after a conversation I had with Fran. Fran, it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and we created a website called covidcap.com, which was just basically trying to put the information that SOCAP and Next Billion and, and uh, GuideStar and many others are candid, we're all putting together, but putting it into a searchable database. And we ended up amassing over several months over a trillion dollars of resources for uh, entrepreneurs around the world. And we had about 40,000 of them visit our site and use it um, to, to find capital, which is amazing. The reason we were we were so successful in getting the word out is because we also partnered with a group that came out of the WEF, um, which created a COVID-19 Rapid Response Alliance, specifically around social entrepreneurs and this role of these guys as first responders. And I just wanted to, um, remind you of some of the things that that group has learned. The, the, the Alliance is continuing um, through the year, which I think is important because I think we are, you know, heading towards a second wave in, so, in some in some uh, areas of the globe um, and the information is different. So I want to give you two examples um, and I'm not like Monique, I can't talk and post at the same time. So <laughs> I don't know how you do that, uh, but the you know one example is um, 60 decibels, which is doing has been doing an amazing job at assembling data from the enterprises that it works with. They actually have a COVID-19 dashboard, um, and so that you can get a sense of you know who's worried about their health, who's feeling financially vulnerable. Um, uh, and I'll just give you one um, uh, stat that I pulled off the site yesterday. There's a, a, a high percentage of, um, uh, I think, customers of Impact Enterprises reporting, who are feel, reporting that they feel highly vulnerable still today. And about 25% of those, when they said, what is causing your feeling of vulnerability? It was, I'm not sure I'm gonna have enough food. So that back to basics theme that Monique started with, we now can aggregate the evidence of that 
um, and um, you know start to understand that was in three countries. That was in Rwanda, Sierra, Sierra Leone, and, and Kenya. Um, another uh, group that's been doing an amazing amount of work in this that's part of the Alliance is the Andy Network. In April, they did a survey and they found that almost 42% of the small and growing businesses indicated being at risk of failure. By June, 12% of those have al had already failed um, and 37% were still at high risk of failure, right? So we're seeing this layer um, of fragility about the people meeting the needs um, of the the highest um, the highest need uh, clients, and I think that you know coming back up to impact investing, you know what has that meant? Um, what it's mostly meant is in the first six months, and that's what we put on our site. Finance had to simplify, right? So it was um, grants, interest-free loans, right? As much money as you could push out the door with as few strings as possible. Um, and that's why we created the site. I was going to create an impact-focused site, and I quickly realized um, people aren't putting impact strings on any of this. So let's get rid of that, and let's talk about what people need. Um, that um, um, mental health supports, you know, all the kind of things to get you through. How do I how do I manage immediately? Um, we also did a series at Case uh, called uh, Scaling Through Mass Disruption, which interviewed entrepreneurs around the world about how they were actually dealing with the first six months. And I'll post a link to that when I'm when I'm done talking. Um, now what we see is the entrepreneurs need something else. They need um, strategic pivoting support. They need soft loans. I was really glad to see in the other sessions at SOCAP that there's more attention now to recoverable grants variable repayment loans, all of the alternative financing instruments that we've been um, collecting and promoting around the world, you know, through our through our training, uh, online training and other things um, are exactly the right tool for the job at the moment. And so to, to have more and more investors realize the flexible capital instruments um, are extremely important uh, to investors. And then I think the other trend that we were seeing through the alliance, um, and I'm interested in, in others' opinions of, is that um, you know there's when you look across the whole field of or the whole marketplace of impact investing, we're all really happy to see the ESG numbers are rising, right? ESG is outperforming, and so you know something like 40% of uh, the portfolios at Goldman, John Goldstein said the other day, are now integrating uh, ESG into what they are doing. I mean, the the numbers are going wow, are they're, they're they're wildly increasing. But I don't see the same thing happening down the pipeline to the point where the entrepreneurs are getting the funding. And so yeah. I think COVID has shown us, you know, the supply of capital, there's a tremendous amount of it at the top. And the public market, you know, gives a small piece of that to the private market. And then the private market gives, you know, tries to work with entrepreneurs. What have we learned about that pipeline? Because during COVID, we needed to drip that money through faster. Um, and I'd love to actually come back to Monique and Fran to talk a little bit more about how well did that work in the U.S. The government was very active uh, with the PPP and a lot of the impact investment community stepped in to try to make that happen. Um, what did we learn? Yep. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I think we're going to shift a little bit to um, Monique and I speaking a bit about field building at this time, but I'll directly answer um, Kathy's question about the PPP um, and policy in general um, in, in my remarks. So Monique, maybe I'll kick it off and then I'll hand it to you. Sure. Um, so as, as some of you may know, the US Impact Investing Alliance does a lot of work on public policy. Uh, could be anything from uh, fiduciary duty to shareholder rights um, uh, to the CDFI fund, new markets tax credits, um, opportunity zones, a kind of a full range on um, public markets, private markets, community investing, ESG. And um, one, one thing I wanted to share with this group, and it's really more of a call to action, is that um, we believe at the Alliance that within our ecosystem, we need to do better at serving as advocates in policy conversations. Um, the organization, the, the, uh, the field has almost had a kind of under recognition of the importance of public policy and the role that public policy plays in allowing impact capital to flow. Um, there have been, uh, 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 again, this predis 
disposition toward, you know, the government should step aside um, and, and that we know how to solve these issues. Um, but what we've seen time and time again is that impact investors, to do our work effectively, we need an enabling public policy environment. Um, and the events of this year, you know, building on what Kathy just said, has really driven home this point. So, for example, COVID-19, as you folks know, have had profound effects on local economies, which makes this moment also a small business crisis. So various federal programs administered through the Small Business Administration, like the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, like Kathy mentioned, fail to reach the small businesses that need the capital most. And it's important to remember that the PPP was designed for small businesses, but largely was administered through the largest banks. And we know that uh, entrepreneurs of color, women entrepreneurs uh, often don't have those incumbent banking relationships who didn't have access to the PPP resources, the lifeline. CDFIs and minority depository institutions, MDIs, which you've heard uh, quite a bit about on the main stage uh, earlier today, um, have the infrastructure in place to reach black and brown small business owners in underbanked neighborhoods, but they really struggle to access the PPP for their clients. So just to put a fine point on it, and Kathy talked a little bit about small business failure, the New York Fed did a study um, that showed between February and April, 41% of black owned businesses across the country shut down. Um, 32 percent of Latino businesses, 26 percent of Asian businesses, but only 17 percent of white businesses were shuttered. So these gaps in um, core small business infrastructure are really sowing the seeds of an already uneven recovery. We had another uneven recovery. We've had lots of uneven recoveries that further exacerbate um, income inequality, wealth inequality. Um, Another element of the public policy backdrop that's often taken for granted is regulatory mechanisms to promote accountability in the capital markets. Uh, uh, Kathy and Monique both talked about the, the rise of ESG, the flowing of capital into the public markets for ESG um, this year, uh, but wanted to point out that um, in the last few months alone, the Alliance and many in our field push back against significant backsliding from the Department of Labor and the SEC on core impact investing principles. So, for example, the Department of Labor proposed two rules in rapid succession that discouraged the selection of ESG funds and certain pension plans, namely corporate pension plans. They're called ERISA regulated pension pension funds plans, and also claw back previous guidance, clarifying that ESG aligns with fiduciary duty. And both the Department of Labor and the SEC have sought to strip away basic shareholder engagement rights. So as we see the rise of ESG investing from the market, the market speaks. We have um, in the waning months of, the, of the Trump's presidential term, we see a real backsliding. Um, each of these regulatory moves have drastic uh, far-reaching implications for our field. Uh, thousands in the, uh, there were thousands of public comments pushing back on these proposals, so that was heartening to see. So this needs to be the norm going forward uh, for the sake and integrity of, of impact investing, of ESG, that we as impact investors must serve as advocates for the communities and the issues that we care about in broader public policy. So that is my kind of pitch for public policy um, in the context of impact investing field building. And Monique, I know you have thoughts on the topic too. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, that in the US context in specific, which we, we kind of were framed to respond to, certainly the racial reckoning that's underway, um, you know, after the murder of George Floyd and the global protests that it in, uh, inspired really are about accountability in some ways. How are people holding leaders and each other um, feet to the fire around these topics that are so important to everyone. You don't leave your house in the middle of a pandemic because it doesn't matter to you. And so, you know, around the world, we're fighting back against tyranny in many ways and, and um, you know, ensuring that our policies are not just further exacerbating uh, the situation that folks have been suffering under. And we've seen some people respond to that moment with pledges and all the things like that. Um, you know, racial equity pledges and investing racial justice pledges and all these other things. But I think, you know, as we go forward, what does it mean for them to actually live into those pledges? We need to wait and see. Um, but I think there are some other efforts that are happening to get more specific, not just a broad frame I'd like to do some good things, but people are getting tactical in these days. Um, 
you know, there's an uh, interesting development happening around the topic of qualified immunity, which is a policy. And of course, that leads to police brutality in specific ways that really disproportionately affect black and brown people in this country. And so, you know, we've been working on the symptoms. We've been funding solutions to the symptoms, but the disease remains because policy is what needs to be dismantled. Um, as we talk about systems change and other things like that, we need to get into the structural and systemic level policies that enable those poor decisions that force us into choices that maybe give us less than less than perfect responses because the outcomes that we seek are really need to be dealt with from a policy perspective. Um, effort being led by Ben and Jerry and the CEO, uh, sorry, the CEO of Virgin Unite and in partnership with PolicyLink CEO Michael McAfee, literally is trying to get very tactical with um, you know, how does Congress work on qualified immunity as one of a main um, effort to, um, you know, make the world a better place for black and brown people and responding to systemic racism. Um, we've also just have now some quantification around systemic racism and though black and indigenous and people of color's lives have felt it, um, Citibank's research on the cost of racism since 2000 was I think really um, an important milestone to have data um, talking about $16 trillion of the cost of racism in America. Five million, $5 trillion will be added to the US GDP over the next five years if we were to do this. Um, what is it gonna take? And I think it's really important for us to recognize that these are choices that we're making, these are policies. We have some tools already at our disposal. Someone talked about CDFIs. How do we scale up the solutions that we already have out there and do something with the tools that are at our disposal. There have been folks working on blueprints and roadmaps and other things um, long before this moment, but how do we listen? And I think, um, how do we get the right capital to echo Kathy to the right participants? How do we think about job creation and wealth inequality and all these other things? Um, there are folks who've been doing it. So we just need to listen and surface the solutions that have been bubbling up um, and socialize them better, I think, and really commit to taking action. Mission Investors Exchange has been uh, curating some resources related to racial equity for those who are newer to that conversation. There's a lot of information there to help folks get started. So I'll pause there on in terms of, um, you know, what's happening in the United States. And really, I think, you know, how do we ensure the durable change someone asked earlier? It's um, the accountability question. So I think that I'll pass it to Kathy to <laughs> the next part of the conversation. Pick it up on accountability. I just wanted to say thank you for Monique for, for you know, giving us the broad swath of, you know, what are the, you know, how do we talk economically um, about what we all morally know needs to change and and you know try to, to to bring more people onto this i just wanted to tack on to what you're saying which kind of leads to the accountability topic which is i've been i've been approached by several um i won't name them but groups of membership groups of pension funds who are basically saying we must nail this uh racial equity issue um, and so you have, you know, the biggest supply side players and they just have no idea where to start. Right. And so realizing that, you know, it comes down to metrics that, you know, what can they actually ask for? Well, it depends what people are actually doing down the chain. So it actually goes to accountability, which is our next topic. But I just want to say, I love the fact that and Avery had this great comment about, you know, there's demand now, right. That there was a, there was a backlash against what some of the regulatory choices were that, that Fran has been so heartily fighting against um, but there's a backlash among the financial services providers saying this is absolutely not what our clients want right now um, you know we have evidence saying that this stuff outperforms and the clients are going to follow that and how dare you try to tire him <laughs> doing that that seems irresponsible um, but this demand this this idea that COVID has created different kinds of demands from different people um and that you know when you are going to try to integrate you know what you have to what you end up with is kind of what do i count what do i what what can i what can i report on what can i pass what can i learn and then what can i pass on and so i think we're going to turn to this issue of accountability which we talked about at the front end with one of the questions we talked a little bit about you know the backsliding of accountability by federal agencies um, you know, from where I sit, you know, I think one of the most significant um, changes in the uh, marketplace this year is that we have 
started to see, you know, by the good work of many, many people we know have been working on this for a very long time, um, an emerging set of standards, principles, um, and so on that are, that are starting to be adopted, you know, from things like the IFC principles, which hit over 100 signatories in June, um, the SDG impact standards, which now exist for private equity bonds and are coming out on enterprises shortly, um, Tideline launched Bluemark uh, to start to verify those standards as a third party. I am certain the other accounting firms are going to jump in uh, uh, soon, and they actually announced last month, month at a World Economic Forum event a set of common metrics that they wanted to um, audit for ESG. Um, so I think, like, I'm going to turn to Monique and Fran to talk about this, but in you know the, the framing I see is I think the challenge now is how do you make this easy? How do you make this interconnected and widespread? It's like, if you're the only person that has a fax machine, it's useless, right? Mm -hmm. So unless there's a standard that speaks across um, the chain um, that makes people, helps people make better decisions, whether it's this pension fund trying to decide how to um, support racial, racial equity or someone else trying to support an SDG um, or something else, you know, how do we make sure that we're not just writing more reports that we're actually making better decisions about what impact is actually happening and where and where money can flow. So I guess the specific question for both you and Fran, both Fran and Monique is, can you speak a little bit about the importance of accountability for our field um, and the broader capital markets in light of this year? And do you think we're getting this right? And how will we know? Monique, do you mind if I jump in first just to offer some high level comments and, and then hop to you? Um, so yes, this issue of accountability um, is so important and we've worked so long and so hard as a, a field on the quantification and qualification of impact. There, there are a lot of uh, activities going on around impact harmonization that I'll talk about in a second, um, as well as corporate disclosure. So. Um, I, I ended with uh, some of the US regulatory backsliding. Um, and that said, I, I do think that the acceptance of financial materiality of sustainability issues of impact factors is finally entering the mainstream. Um, although his uh, proxy voting record, BlackRock's pro proxy voting record on climate and other ESG issues doesn't entirely bear this out. Uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock since 2018, has continued to place long-term issues like climate change at the forefront of his annual letter to CEOs. He issues that every January. Um, in March, there was uh, an incredible public statement uh, published by CalSTRS, which is the California State Pension uh, uh, California State Pension for Teachers, the Teachers Retirement System, joined with the largest pension fund in the world, Japan's $1.5 trillion government pension fund, and the UK-based USS investment management, they published a letter that was really unprecedented, a public statement against short-termism. Um, and they believe that short-termism leaves their portfolios as universal asset owners exposed to what they call potentially catastrophic systemic risks, which has only been, uh, um, you know, fine point has been put on that um, because of the current crisis set, the market volatility, um, et cetera. So it's like, what is the, we talk so much about alpha, but what is the uh, the beta risk, which I know uh, Delilah Rothenberg um, at the Predistribution Network is doing some really interesting work on that. So it's not always all about alpha, it's also about beta, and we've seen that um, over the last uh, six months or so. Um, so I think we are driving toward a mainstream agreement that long-term ESG factors are relevant and material. The question is, how do we hold uh, corporations accountable to those indicators? There are a lot of different approaches. It's largely been voluntary, voluntary corporate re reporting to date on ESG metrics. Uh, something like 80, 85% of all the, the, the top thousand um, uh, corporations in the world do issue a sustainability report, but those impacts are, you know, cherry picked, self-reported, unverified, unaudited. Um, another tool is shareholder resolutions and shareholder engagement, which we know is getting chipped away at, um, at least in the United States. There is increasing reliance on third party public engagement efforts like Just Capital, which ranks U.S. publicly traded companies on how well they serve different stakeholders, including workers, um, customers, communities. 
Um, we're looking to see rising watchdog functions uh, and watchdog organizations uh, in this area. And finally, of course, mandated disclosure through legislation and regulation. So we have someone talking about carrots and sticks, you know, regulation and legislation is a stick for sure. Um, you all know that there's this roundtable statement, the 181 CEOs a pledge to pursue value of all their stakeholders, not just shareholders. Um, so while that was encouraging, we now know that there's there has been a lack of follow through or, um, you know, we, we in the Alliance talk about regulation and self-regulation and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a little bit unclear uh, what the proof is in self-regulation. There was a recent report from KKS advisors called the Test for Corporate Purpose that concluded that the BRT Business Roundtable signatories largely failed to deliver on their statements of purpose in the midst of COVID. Um, but just to end on a slightly more positive note that um, perhaps not surprisingly doesn't have to do with the US, there's significant regulatory process being made in Europe. So the European Commission is currently working on regulation that would mandate standardized ESG disclosure for corporations, right? This is something that in our field, we think, you know, we, we shoot for ESG mandated disclosure on the 10K. Um, so the European Commission on the, at the federal government level is, is working on that. The IFRS, which is, the gap generally accepted accounting principles outside the US. They're in a consultation period to develop sustainability accounting standards. And these developments could drive very substantial change in the global capital market. So we're not giving up on US leadership for mandated disclosure and an economic system that serves all stakeholders just yet. <laughs> but at the moment, it's really heartening to see the leadership seeing the European Commission and the European Union step up. And we'd love to see that keep that momentum going. Great. Monique, would you like to take the same issue? Yeah, I think I'll just talk a little bit about Sir Ronald Cohen and George Seraphim's effort as a relatively newer um, kid on the block, impact weighted accounts. I, you know, I've been uh, the privilege of having a few conversations with Sir Ronnie in the last couple of weeks through SOCAP. And I think, you know, I've heard a little bit about it. I should share a little bit more. And also there's a great piece out of HPR that describes it a little bit. And I think it's a really important development to the point of, um, if I just shared, you know, the third party disclosure and evidence is much different and you can trust it in a different way than self-reported and not independently verified. Partly the impact transparency that we're all calling for with all of these accountability efforts and standardizations is related to can we trust this information? And if we cannot, then certainly that has implications. But um, how do you get to true impact? And that's exactly what this effort is trying to figure out is what are these negative externalities that don't show up in the balance sheet, that don't show up in your 10Ks or whatever reporting you have in your country. Um, and what can it tell you when we, when third parties get a chance to quantify, especially things that are social, squishier, environmental, things that are harder to quantify. So this effort that they put in uh, assessed over nearly 2,000 companies in their data set, I think um, really what is, probably intuited to some that the profits that some have made would be wiped out by the opposite end of environmental damage they've caused. That's powerful. Understanding that from not just probably, I think that's that's likely the case, to having the math, having the data, and really efficient market theory suggests that if you knew this in a verifiable, quantifiable way, you would take that information in, into your account for your investing purposes. So I think in the sample set specifically, I'm citing it here, 1,694 companies that turned a profit in 2018, 15% of those would have seen their profits wiped out by the environmental damages the offset. So what does this mean? What can that do for impact transparency if you know this? Number one, they suggest governments will be able to tax companies for the harm they cause instead of where we have now. You can pinpoint exactly who the bad actors are and hold their feet to the fire, which we kept keep talking about is really important because if governments have the dollars to deliver on the changes that they need to do from the policies and really can take some action, certainly that has great implications for our work and, and radical collaboration in order to deliver on these goals. Investors will be able to price these social environmental impacts into their analysis, efficient, trans efficient market theory we just said, and the transparency will allow customers, individuals, companies, people, employees to vote with their feet on the companies that reflect their values. And this is an important um, tool for empowerment for everyone to make the choices that they feel really reflect who they are. 
And of course, this guards against impact washing, that you said it did the thing and it doesn't do the thing. Um, and that's really an important thing to be able to verify. So I'll stop there, but I think that it's a pretty exciting initiative and, and there are many others out there who are doing some interesting work, but that's a recent one that um, many might not have heard so much about just yet. Thanks, Monique. Um, we've been nibbling around the edges of stakeholder capitalism, kind of referring to it, but not really addressing it squarely. Um, a number of groups in our field, the, 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 the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, the GIN, B-Lab, Imperative 21, and many, many others are collaborating to actively think about what a reimagined economic system could look like. At the very least, I think there's an acknowledgement that we need to move beyond the current system, which incentivizes short-termism and extractive behaviors. Um, but for that, we really need full-scale acceptance of the financial materiality of impact factors and you know, the impact-weighted accounts and other um, the other kinds of activities that, that I mentioned earlier and, and Kathy mentioned earlier are steps toward that. There's also the compact, co a concept of impact materiality alongside traditional, more traditional financial materiality. And that would be a company's impact on their employees' economic well-being, for example. So whereas financial materiality is, um, you know, ESG factors are financially material to the investor. Impact materiality looks at the um, material impact on the world and on stakeholders uh, that are rendered by uh, companies. And finally, there's, you know, if we're kind of going a step further from financial materiality to impact materiality to shifting of power dynamics. So that would be another piece of the conversation um, that's been circulating around this idea of reimagined capitalism. We've seen some smaller scale local examples like Ujima Fund in Boston of these kinds of com con concepts, which is very much um, sharing or seeding power to re local residents, local entrepreneurs uh, to be invested in their priorities and what they think is best for their communities. Um, but on a broader scale, transferring power to achieve greater equity in the capital markets would require uh, a, a lot of government intervention or a wholesale cultural shift in the business community. So um, I think in some ways we're still having the debate about the financial materiality of impact in the kind of mainstream capital markets, but would love to know if either of you are seeing any early signs of stakeholder capitalism trends or ideas being put forth around broader power shifting that would be, you know, real systems change. So Kathy, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I, you know, I have a, a long-standing devotion to this topic as, you know, we built the whole framework of B corporations around stakeholder management, right? That's the core of that frame that we created 10 years ago. Um, and then to see the business roundtable and others affirm that um, has been, you know, amazing. And for B Lab and others to say, you know, we, we have some experience in this that you can learn from. Um, but I would also say that, you know, in looking at this, and you mentioned, Fran, some reports on, you know, kind of what have people done around their different stakeholders. I actually think we're we have a little bit of a, a intellectual vacuum <laughs> around what the practice is that we want people to um, actually take up to show that they are actually doing this. Um, and I'll give you an example. Right there was a there was a piece, and Fran put it on her LinkedIn profile a few weeks ago in the New York Times that basically said that some of the signatories of the business roundtable had during the pandemic. Um, fired multiple thousands of employees and the next week bought back some of their stock, right? And so, you know, realizing that, you know, unlike, you know, we, we've, we've been really kind of uncomfortable in impact investing, in impact investing saying there's always a trade-off between finance and good. <laughs> when you're talking about stakeholders, there is a trade-off. You get $1, where are you going to put it? <laughs> are you going to put it into the employee pool or in, in pay? Are you going to hold it for a rainy day? Or are you going to pay off the people that, that own you? You have to make these choices. And I feel like maybe I haven't seen it. So this is a plea to the people on um, this session. I'm really, I'm looking right now for really good frameworks or uh, writings or kind of intellectual capital around how uh, people manage 
stakeholder discrepancies and choices and what we expect um, companies to do. Well, I think what we're doing now is reporting what they did afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that is imperfect. I don't think that at the public company level, we're very good at, 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 at making that part of the auditing, right? When, if somebody makes a choice, um, you know, to do layoffs and then and then uh, and then pay their owners. Do we even know about it? Is that even triggered in the in a, in a, some sort of audit or in an impact audit or something else for us to know about? And so I just feel like, um, you know, well, two of the questions at the beginning were how is impact in dis investing different from five years ago? This is one way it's hugely different. We now have, you know, the, the CEOs of the planet committing to this concept. Um, let's make it real for them. Let's let's and, and another question at the beginning was what's not happening fast enough. Lindsay asked that. I think this is one of those things. I think we're going to lose this opportunity if we don't um, put their feet to the fire. So um, that's that's what that's my that's my plea on that topic. Um, and please help me if there are other things that we can be learning to see um, how to. Um, make this real at this for the for the people for the impact investing community you know what what can impact investors do to to hasten this conversation monique with, uh, turn it over to you on on stakeholders yeah and i think there are a few folks who we have some green shoots there too on who's doing it well and right or at least uh attempting to fail faster or fail publicly um you know i think that the work of heron on really listening to communities and not just listening, which has been the trend of like the conversation from even five years ago, if we think about that, but actually seeding power. And one of the ways they're seeding power directly is to take the five to 10 communities that they have been deeply you know, engaged with over time and actually give them the power to um, you know, decide on the dollars that they have been allocated. So this is an interesting trend. Um, paralleling directly to move the capital and the deployment decision making and the systems thinking as part of our conversation in in impact investing in others i think we started a little more rudimentary with um you know getting people to deploy one additional dollar but now we're thinking about how is that deployed and is it moving the needle is it addressing structural and systemic stuff um in august impact alpha had a call on systems thinking dialogue with the systemic racism conversation, which was an in interesting juxtaposition. And for those who weren't there, I'm putting the link in the chat that you can read more a little about it. Um, you know, we had uh, the investment integration project who's been out front talking about systems change on uh, systems level investing and Dimitri Duckett uh, from who heads capital for the new majority at Living Cities on that conversation. And I think this just even talking about systems change as part of this dialogue as within this movement is um, a bit of a shift. Certainly there are some forward thinkers who had been there, but this is kind of an acceptable level of conversation to be had in generalized spaces, which was, I think, rare, um, even from just when I started in impact investing a few years ago. So um, I think there's another great example um, that recently came out just this month, um, you know, World Resources Institute talking about aligning their entire endowment with Paris agreement goals. Uh, you might've thought they were already there, um, so that they weren't is an important indication and the fact that they were willing to get out front and really think about all the ways to think through, um, you know, climate as a systems change question and how that percolates and, and cross cuts throughout our society and our investing practices, I think is, is interesting to note. Great. Um, so before we we're heading towards the last, uh, 15, 12 minutes of the session. Um, I'm gonna ask us each to kind of come back with some wrap up questions. But we, before we do that, I'm gonna give you two or three minutes to see if there are any questions from the beginning that we popcorned that you want to address now that we've gone through some more detail, Fran or Monique. Yeah, I'll just start. There was a question on careers earlier on, which I get a lot, I'm sure Kathy and Fran, you get those quite as well. Um, Certainly some of the resources that are curated on various jobs board on the gin and the green jobs list and some others, um, you, you know, some some of it is a little bit of insider. And so those folks who are interested in careers, I think talking to people here because it is 
you know, niche within the scale of larger frame of finance. But there are quite a number of opportunities and a lot of opportunities for young people to get smart, to attend conferences that are open to the public like this and others to understand what's going on. I might have a visitor who's about 18 months old, just in a little while in case he decides that he needs to come see mama. But um, I think that's important thinking about the future of the field. He might be a future impact investor himself. Um, but you know, I think careers are an important question, but there are many roles. And I think what I often feel to folks is, I don't have a finance background, is there any job for me? But there are measuring and management and all the kinds of functions to run a business that are within impact investing too. And so the field I think has room for a lot of different people and a lot of smart, adaptable people. And um, you know, being able to to do a run a spreadsheet in your sleep is not the only requirement in order to be effective at an impact investing. So I'll pause there and allow um, Kathy and Fran to address some of the other questions. Kathy, do you want to go? I would just echo what Monique said. I mean, I answer this question about careers probably every day, every day, uh, in some way um, through through what we do in training our MBA students, and and then it's it appears that every undergraduate at Duke wants to be an impact investor recently. So uh, it is extremely popular topic uh, in this generation, as many of you know. Um, and I and I I you know we have we have job boards listed on caseI3.org. We have uh, many many resources uh, for people who are at, at different stages in their careers. And the number one thing I say, as Monika said, is there's jobs managing money, in which case you do need to have a finance background or get one. Um, and there's a lot of jobs advising and consulting, um, and even more as the impact measurement space. Um, which allows me to kind of go back to something that a thread that was in the the chat, which is you know worry that we have too many systems um, and that is a paralyzing uh, impact uh, effect on uh, people or or allows more greenwashing these people to kind of choose a system that works for them yeah it's a huge issue um, and you know we're we, we have not gotten to the place where we have a gap a, you know a generally accepted way of doing this but I think we're making uh, tremendous progress um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I wrote down from the from the you know somebody said uh, you know what would it take to radically boost this field? Um, Fran or Monique, do you yeah. have anything on that? Um, yeah. So Evan um, Gill asked a question that sort of relates to one that Ruth Shaber um, uh, typed in earlier. Ruth was asking about you know what is it going to take? What is the um, what is the data set to suggest that uh, impact investing doesn't have to be concessionary? And on the other side, Evan asks, uh, when uh, you're seeing a shift in how capital is deployed from market rate to lower cost alternatives, such as recoverable grants and some of the tools that you talked to that you opened with, Kathy. And this is sort of, a, you know, a, a perennial, just like how do you measure impact as a perennial? It's, you know, is there a trade-off? Does there have to be a trade-off? Um, does it matter? And the, the and of, of course, there's a trade-off at times. Um, and I think what it would take to get to scale on some of the lower return, high impact tools that Kathy was talking about, whether it's demand dividend or revenue rights or um, recoverable grants, low interest loans, zero interest loans, um, I think will require um, I don't think we get there just by high net worth individuals doing like bespoke deals and foundations doing bespoke PRIs. I think that those are really important. We'll hear about a lot of them in the context of SOCAP, but I think what Evan is really asking about is how do we turbocharge them? And it's a, such a good question. Um, I think the ultimate answer is that folks need to be thinking about the nature of value. And I know that this is like the um, perilously close to the wheelhouse of Jed Emerson, who's with us, but you know, the nature of value itself. And um, to the extent that folks can start rethinking about how value gets created in a kind of a basket across social, economic, environmental, and, imp and, and financial impact um, and returns is really important. And, and I think that's what it's, it's gonna take a mindset shift, which is what we have been talking about today. Um, again, not to minimize the, the, the fact, I love fantastic bespoke creative deals, but like how many complicated brain cell killing, cat complicated capital stacks can you do? Um, on the other hand, we've been talking to, um, 
the folks at the Federal Reserve about how to create a, um, potentially a, a facility or a window at the Fed for CDFIs. Um, so something like that that's a static. Is that Levi? <laughs> Hi. Hello. Sorry Everyone for the introduction. <laughs> What a key. So I got my dog barking, you got your kid. Reality is stepping into our yeah, this is right. Um, all your stagecraft goes out the door exactly. when a toddler starts screaming in the background. <laughs> yeah, so just thinking about um I think we need to be thinking about scale replicable solutions in order for us to get to the magnitude of of change uh versus nibbling around the edges with super creative but uh kind of not less replicable um uh deals so feel like we should probably shift to some of these like last thoughts um but sure. looking at the this has been such a robust chat and i wish that we could like all spend an afternoon together because all of your comments and questions are so rich um but maybe we can shift to like a little lightning okay. round around yeah let's do some lightning round yeah. i'll set it up um I just want to say thank you. The chat has been amazing. And that one of the great silver linings of all of these virtual events is the, the sub conversations that can happen uh, uh, be below and above, between, between uh, the main conversations and how grateful we are for all of that, for all of you. So the lightning round, I'm going to set it up. There's really two questions. The first question is, what do you think we're going to see in the next year within the impact investing ecosystem? What do you think is likely that's going to be interesting? And then the second question, we'll do that round first. Second question is, what do you think is actually needed for durable system change? That's not part of your first answer. That would be nice to see if we could wave our magic wand. So Fran, what do you think is likely in the next year? Um, what I think is likely in the next year, we, we, we talked about business roundtable and wanting to put uh, kind of words into action. I hope to see um, very high level of public accountability for commitments, corporate commitments to DEI and racial equity, not just corporate actually, from asset managers, from investors and others. I think it is, um, there have been proliferate uh, DEI and racial equity um, commitments and, and Monique talked about them earlier, but having the kind of um, public accountability, public engagement, uh, watchdog organizations that can really hold folks accountable so that there's truth in advertising around this, like the most, this, this most essential area. Monique, can I ask you the lightning round now or would you like yeah, to pause? We can ask the lightning round now. Um, I, I think one of the things that I mentioned earlier what's missing, and I think this is part of this conversation here with the, what we need to see in the next year, what might we see, I'm hopeful that we see um, an increase in catalytic capital and folks willing to think about, um, you know, what is needed to build the field, what is needed to do the R and pay for the R and D needed for this field, whether that be supporting some public goods, some other kind of ideas, initiative, you know, new initiatives, and other ways to ensure that we can radically collaborate. And I hope that I we see an increasing and sustained dissatisfaction with incrementalism. I think we've largely been content to say we're taking some action, and so that's sufficient. Um, but people are not in the streets because some actions in a small scale with slow speed are have been sufficient. Um, we need massive changes and we need them urgently because of the challenges that we have ahead of ourselves. Um, and these new solutions need to be intersectional. They need to be interdis interdisciplinary. And we need to really think about lowering our egos so that we can effectively collaborate. And I think those are some of the changes I hope to see. I don't know if we will see them, um, but I think this idea that everyone might share a bit of convergence around outcomes and human-centered design from governments to the social sector to business, um, you know, I think there's a broad awareness and, you know, Impact Alpha framed it as an impact on world. And can we collectively make the choices to make that so. So I think, you know, you're asking what might we see? We can make some predictions, but we can also ask for it. And I think those are what I'd like to ask for. Great. And my uh, smaller prediction perhaps than some of those is I think we're going to see more and more auditing of impact, whether that's verification, assurance, or auditing, whatever the right word is. I think we're going to see the accounting firms step in. I was just reading a 
survey of 4,400 accountants around the globe and two thirds of them think that they should be doing this. Um, uh, and so I think that's gonna happen. I think it's gonna be on the easy stuff though. I think it's gonna be on the stuff that we think is not all that interesting and not all that telling. It's gonna be around outputs and, and um, not necessarily the things that are proxies for, for real impact, but are really kind of the, the things that they think are within the realm of related, highly correlated to economic value. Um, and I would love to ask the second question, which is what do you think is actually needed for systemic change and how can impact inv investors contribute to that? Monique, you wanna? Yeah, so I've been reading a book called Emergent Strategy, which might be life-changing and I'm only in the introduction. Um, the idea, um, we are living in the ancestral imagination of others. So our current reality is choices others have made. What does that mean? Who were they thinking about when they were thinking about who would be participating in our economies and our democracies? They, at least our states, we're not expecting anyone on this call, at least, to be working, to be voting, um, to be participating in a thriving economy. So what are the choices we're going to make to um, you know, support the future lives that are represented of the imagination that we have right now? And I think it's a new narrative we need. I think one of the things that will ensure durable change is a new imagination of not just capitalism, of what it means when we allow everyone who's been marginalized and disenfranchised to thrive. And what are those choices, um, structural and systemic, that we need, to, um, we need to make right now so that the ancestral imagination that our children and our children's children now live in is a fair and a just one. And I think um, today we can start by seeing what that future that we've never lived in looks like by asking the creatives and others who deal with narrative to um, allow us into their spaces as finance and, and impact investing people who normally are not in those creative spaces to allow us to um, be, our minds to be expanded about what is possible. And I think that will help uh, ensure those durable changes that we require. Coffee, do you want to go or shall I? Uh, you can go. Why don't you go? Okay. Um, Monique, thank you. Um, I want to read that book. <laughs> um, in terms of durable and lasting change, um, I'm going to end on a note that I started with, which is the importance of public policy, just in terms of the scale of change and the magnitude of the capital and incentives we need to leverage. Um, I mentioned the regulatory backslidings, uh, but and, and you know the alliance spends a lot of time playing defense. Um, but we also want to think proactively about how public policy can help further our objectives as a field, um, scale our efforts to enact systems change. And we've seen that both the private sector and philanthropy are really overwhelmed by the current crisis. That we need government. I mean, there's a crisis of in, of of. of uh, of belief and, and trust in institutions and government in particular um, for reasons that uh, are probably obvious. But we, we really do need to lead with government with smart catalytic, catalytic policy making. So I hope to see, and I think that um, real durable change will um, happen with a resurgence of collaboration across sectors. Right, we are slightly over time. My my small uh, uh, plea, which is a smaller answer, and maybe I should have given it before Fran gave her larger <laughs> answer, was um, I think that we are going to need to pay attention to stakeholders. Employees matter. Um, their ability to feed their kids and and have housing and all these other things it, it's been made, it's been made so much clearer, and we need to take advantage of this moment to do that to change the system, you know, people are talking about the Great Reset. I believe the Great Reset is needed. I don't think we're going to get there until we start nibbling away at some very small things um, consistently. And we sure need policy to do that. So um, please join me in thanking Monique and Fran um, and thanking the all of the audience uh, that has been chatting and sharing resources yeah. and poking. This is an amazing session. We totally enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your great chats and have a great SoCap.